um, if you would, um, make sure that you're on mute so um, uh, we, can, um, we can have our speaker be uh, unencumbered there. Uh, one quick note before we get um, into our usual things. Um, uh, I want to point out next week we have a talk on Wednesday the 18th. A woman named Rebecca Herman um, has a book called... Um, uh, no useless mouth, and it's about uh, the American Revolution. She's doing this from the UK, so that's going to be at noon our time because it'll be six o'clock her time. So it's not the usual seven p.m. thing. So please make a note of that if you want to tune in for that one. That's at noon our time. So um, just a little FYI. Um, a couple things before we get started. Um, as you know, when we do these things, uh, if you have a question, use the chat feature down at the bottom. Um, uh, this one, um, this talk tonight is brought as part of one of the things we've been doing uh, uh, this year. It's called, it's sponsored by Mass Humanities and one of the things called The Vote. And we were trying to do this as a series of uh, women's suffrage things. As you know, this is the 100th anniversary of women actually having, gaining the right to vote in national elections in the United States. And um, Michelle Coughlin is a historian. Uh, she's a museum professional. And it broke my heart that we had this pandemic because she was going to be my co-host and my wingman and my, uh, my scholar in residence for these series of, of talks that we did with the, uh, sponsored by Mass Humanities. Um, and I owe her a great uh, debt of thanks because if you go onto our website, she has been kind of the person behind the curtain. Uh, she's the one that put up and she did a timeline of women's suffrage that you'll find on our on our website. She's the one that uh, helped line up all, all the talks. Um, so um, if you would have, if we had been doing these in Falmouth, she would have been right there with me uh, asking the questions and, and uh, leading the talk. But, uh, and as someone who used to work at the Winslow House in Marshfield, she's written a book on Penelope Winslow. Um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Michelle Coughlin. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, thank you to the Fellow Museums on the Green. It's a pleasure to do this talk. And uh, welcome to everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. And I hope everyone's doing well in these very challenging times. So I study early American women because I really believe they've been underrepresented in the telling of America's story. And if we're not hearing how half the population contributed to the founding of this country, then we're really not getting a full or an accurate picture of the American past. So when we talk about early American women, the European settlers of North America, we know that they all lived under a system of patriarchy. So men were the primary holders of legal, economic, political and social power. Women were looked upon as being uh, morally, intellectually, and physically weaker. And women did not have any expect expectation of a formal advanced education, of holding a profession, or of participating in the political system. But that said, they could hold broad, informal authority and influence in the home, in society, and in their communities, and also in, uh, in economics. Um, so there are a, a variety of ways which they could, uh, they could exert influence. And also at this time, we know that social class was so important that a, a high-ranking woman could potentially wield more power than a man of lesser social rank. And so I really started thinking about this when I was writing my recent book about Penelope Winslow. So Penelope Winslow was married to Plymouth Colony Governor Josiah Winslow, and she was a member of the English gentry. She descended from various monarchs. Her third great grandmother was Mary Boleyn, Anne Boleyn's sister. Her father was the first treasurer of Harvard. And she used these connections to help advance her husband's career. But also on a, a more daily note, she really exerted a lot of influence, inf 
informal influence um, in the Plymouth government, if we can look at it, how she served as a gatekeeper to, to Josiah. So Josiah, at this time, uh, he was conducting a lot of personal and Plymouth Colony business from his home. And, and men who came to see him knew that Penelope would be a gatekeeper to Jos Josiah. If he was traveling on business, uh, wasn't there or was in a meeting, you know, you can imagine her being having the power to mediate messages that were given to Josiah. And so men respected this and knew this. Women also knew this. And so I like to imagine the women that would come to Penelope seeking favors or opportunities on their husband's behalf. So I started thinking about how other women in Penelope's position specifically the wives of the colonial governors of the first 13 American colonies, how they used their power and position. And I've been researching them and have found that really despite geographic, chronological, regional, ethnic, and religious uh, differences amongst them, they really showed a willingness to leverage their abilities and their interests in their position to acquire personal and public goals. And so, as I said, this is a subject of my, um, my current book project. So this is a work in progress. And so I, uh, I'm gonna tell you about some of these women tonight and I'd be really happy at the end, I'm gonna talk for about 35 minutes. I'd be happy if, um, you know, if you feel what, that you wanna share feedback or comments or questions, I would certainly welcome those. So the first person I'm gonna talk about is Lady Frances Berkeley. And I disclaimer is that this portrait is probably not of her. Um, it's long been associated with her, however. Um, recent research reveals that it probably is not her, but you know, because of this long association and I'm giving the disclaimer that it probably isn't her, I just wanna show it too because it's a great portrait. Um, and it does have this association with her. So Lady Frances Berkeley was born in England. And when she was a teenager, she came over with her parents. Her father was one of the principal settlers of Virginia. Uh, Lady Frances was educated. She was wealthy. She, as a young woman, she married a man who became governor of North Carolina. He died uh, in 1670. And the couple had no children. so. Frances became the sole uh, inheritor of his estate. So she was a wealthy widow. Uh, not long after her husband's death, she married Sir William Berkeley, who was governor of Virginia. And Sir William was a lot older than she was, but they, they really made a good partnership. They really helped each other uh, seek their own goals. And Sir William actually regarded Lady Frances as his primary political advisor. So much to the point that when in 1675, when he faced a rebellion, he sent Lady Francis to England to seek military aid for him from the king. So this rebellion is called Bacon, it's called Nathaniel Bacon's uh, Rebellion. It was actually, Nathaniel Bacon was actually a distant relative of Lady Francis's. And it was led by uh, Bacon and his followers were colonists of Virginia who did not like the extensive control that was being used by the planter elite of which Lady Frances and Sir William were a part. So Lady Frances gets to London. She is successful in getting the military aid. However, King Charles II, the ruler at the time, wants to know why this rebellion broke out. And so he wants Sir William to go to London and give an accounting and Lady Frances really takes the bold step of um, interceding because William doesn't want to go to London and she doesn't want William to have to go to London. So she, she kind of begs for more time from the king and she says, my husband needs to attend to his estates, he's in poor health, etc. So she does manage in buying him some time. So by the time Lady Frances returns to Virginia with the troops, the rebellion has crumbled uh, following the death of Nathaniel Bacon. And uh, also on board the ship that Lady Frances arrives back in are some commissioners sent by Charles II to look into the conditions in Virginia. And so 
uh, Lady Frances and Sir William, you know, delay as long as they can before Sir William does have to go to London to meet with the king. And this is in 1677. Uh, he dies shortly after arriving in London, so he never really gets to deal with the, the whole episode. Um, and one of the commissioners that Charles II has sent over uh, to look into the state of things in Virginia, he becomes the acting governor of Virginia. And Lady Frances is not happy with this. And rather than thinking that her role in Virginia's future is over, she takes it upon herself to form a coalition of her husband's, her late husband's closest advisors. And they meet at her plantation home, which is called Green Spring. The group becomes known as the Green Spring Faction. And she is the widely acknowledged leader of this faction. And so the group uh, take it upon themselves to, they really try and undermine the, uh, the acting governor, Herbert Jeffries. So they're dealing with his council, they're dealing with the legislature, and um, they go on like this for a few years until 1680, when another governor comes over to take Jeffries' place. And this governor is actually Lady Frances's relative. His name is Sir Thomas Culpepper. So she figures it's time to dissolve the coalition, the faction, and she does. Shortly thereafter, she marries for a third time. She marries one of the members of the group. His name is Philip Ludwell. And together, they um, are able to achieve the governorship of North Carolina for him. The couple travels back and forth between England and Virginia and in, in North Carolina. Francis becomes active in court circles. Uh, but she continues to have a reputation in Virginia, and she's entrusted with the, the other members of the planter elite with correspondence, and she brings back information. And interestingly, she continues to be known as Lady Berkeley, even though she's, she's remarried to Philip Ludwell. And so this is her, the identity that she has fashioned for herself. And um, you know, she succeeds in, in going forth and carrying out this, um, the role that she's carved out for herself. And she remains one of the most powerful women in Virginia's history. She's pretty well known in Virginia. She's probably the best known of the governor's wives. Now this lady, Armagot Prince Papagoya, she is the lady on the right. Um, and with, pictured with her sister is such a, a darling little portrait. Um, so she is someone probably, I'm not going to assume, but I, I'm not going to say none of you have heard from her, of her, but very few people have heard of her. So she was a first lady of New Sweden, which was founded in 1638. And her father was Johann Prince. He was the longest serving governor of New Sweden. And I'm identifying Armagot with Delaware because the longest serving capital of New Sweden was Fort Christina, which is located in present day Delaware, although New Sweden um, did encompass parts of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So Armagot as a young woman is, she's living in New Sweden and she, she'd grown up in Sweden, but she came over uh, as, a, as a teenager, I believe, um, with her family. And so she, there's a man who comes, a military uh, leader who comes to New Sweden, from Sweden. She catches his eye. He really wants to marry her. She takes some persuading. And so he goes to these great efforts to convince her to marry him. He even has a le letter of introduction from Queen Christina. She does agree to marry him. The couple have several children. Armagot's father goes back to Sweden in 1653, at which point um, Armagot's husband, Johan Papagoya, he becomes the governor, acting governor of New Sweden. He's only there for a year. So it's in the, I'm going to tell you what Armagot does with her future, but um, in the larger scheme of things, she is much more of an impact on the development of New Sweden than her husband. She refuses to go back to Sweden with him. She wants to oversee the properties that her father has left in New Sweden, which she does. In, in 1655, the Dutch who, had, who control New Netherlands, they take over New Sweden. 
so it comes under Dutch rule, rule. Uh, during the course of their takeover, some of her properties have been looted. And so she has a, quite a job to kind of um, get repair her properties and reclaim some um, personal property. Um, fast forward nine years to when New Sweden, which had become New Netherland, is taken over by the British in 1664. And um, then five years later, Armagat becomes in, involved in a conspiracy to return the territory to Swedish rule. So we don't know all of the details of this plot, but she was integrally involved in it, and she's corresponding with people back in Sweden. So we don't know, you know how high of a level this went up to in Sweden. Um, the plot doesn't get very far. The conspirators are found out and they're punished. Um, they lose some of their property or banished, but Armagat escapes unscathed. And it's because of her position. Um, and in fact, there's a, a, the governor of, the British governor of the territory, he describes his um, anger with Armagat for having partaken in this plot, even though what he, he perceived she had been treated very well by the British government. So she does stay in the area, in the territory, uh, for several years. She ultimately does go back to Sweden where she dies. But that is Armagat. And now we have Hannah Penn. Now, everyone has heard of William Penn as the founder of Pennsylvania. So William Penn was given the territory of Pennsylvania by King Charles II in recognition of a debt that King Charles, King Charles's father, Charles I, had owed William Penn's father, who was an admiral who had served Charles I. So William Penn and Hannah were both Quakers. So William Penn got the idea of founding Pennsylvania as a haven for Quakers who were persecuted in England. And so, you know, we, we know about his long association with Pennsylvania and its development, Philadelphia as a city of brotherly love, et cetera. But what people don't know is that William Penn suffered a stroke in 1712. He started a series of strokes that significantly disabled him. And Hannah acted as acting proprietor of Pennsylvania from 1712 until William's death in 1718. And then eight years more because she was the um, executrix of William's will. So during that time, she, she, she did a lot. So William Penn was not a great financial manager. He had actually had to mortgage Pennsylvania at one point and had been imprisoned for, death, for debt. Hannah was, she did have some financial skills because of her background. Her father was a wealthy merchant. Uh, she had a number of siblings who died young and it's believed her father kind of groomed her to, to take over, to inherit the business. So she did, she does seem to have um, some financial, some accounting and mathematical training. It's, um, it's clear that she was, she did do a good job getting the uh, colony on good financial footing. She also did a number of other things. She, uh, she resolved a border dispute with Maryland. She really tried to maintain harmonious relationships with the native peoples and she was involved in, in, with a number of treaties and she ensured that uh, Quakers rights would continue to be represented. So she wasn't governing alone, of course. There were uh, governors on the ground in Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, um, there were legislators on the ground in Pennsylvania and she actually was doing this from England. So she only lived in Pennsylvania for a couple of years. Um, so during this time, you know, she's overseeing Pennsylvania and do, taking care of all these matters of governance. Um, she's also overseeing the properties she's inherited from her father, overseeing her and William's properties because William is incapacitated, uh, taking care of her family, et cetera, et cetera. So she's you know, pretty remarkable person. And uh, to date, to date, she is the only woman to have governed Pennsylvania. Um, and in fact, according to the Rutgers Center for American Women, women in Politics, only 44 women have governed 30 American states. 
So it's something to think about. And we call, you know, I, I call Hannah Penn the only female colonial governor. She wouldn't have used that term. It's anachronistic. She wouldn't have thought of herself in that way. But she was, she did have the authority to oversee uh, colonial affairs. Um, so I'm calling her the only female governor. So now we're going to another Quaker, Anne Coddington of Rhode Island. So Anne, this event I'm going to tell you about uh, took place before, even before Anne's husband William became governor of Rhode Island. He was a, he was wealthy merchant. Um, he was prominent. He had been governor of Newport when that was a separate entity. But uh, what I'm finding, this story about Anne um, reflects some of one of the things I've been finding about finding out about these women is that I'm seeing a willingness to take stands and to achieve goals or to attempt to achieve goals before, during, and after the times that their husbands were governors. So this speaks to a broader, it's not just I'm leveraging my position as a governor's wife. This really speaks to a broader history of independence and autonomy in the colonial period that I think needs to be further explored. So Anne's particular circumstance, she, as I said, she and her husband were Quakers, and she wrote this really um, extraordinary um, note to the governor of Massachusetts, John Endicott, following the execution of her friend and fellow Quaker, Mary Dyer. So Mary Dyer, um, she's pretty, pretty well known in colonial history because she and three of her fellow Quakers have been put to death. Uh, and this is something that really helped turn the tide with uh, attitudes towards Quakers. Um, for Mary Dyer's situation, she had been in, she'd, go, she'd been banished from Massachusetts. She kept going back. She'd actually even been uh, once condemned to death. She was basically just about to be on the scaffold uh, when, they, when the governor gave her a reprieve. They didn't want to go to the step of executing this woman. But after that last incident, Mary Dyer did re return to Massachusetts. She clearly was taking a stand on behalf of Quakers and she was executed. And so Anne Coddington points out the hypocrisy in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts government's um, stand here she says, you will profess that you are Christians and walk according to the commands of Christ. If so, where will you find that Christ commanded such be put to death? So in, uh, what's extraordinary about Anne in her personal circumstances, um, the, the longer letter talks about she, how she hesitated to send this because this is a really bold step to address the governor of another colony in this way. Um, she was grappling with this decision, and then she lost, a few weeks after the death of Mary Dyer, she lost a child. And this event, uh, she took to be a sign from God that she had to, she had to speak out. Um, so this is, you know, on a, this is on a small scale, this petition, but it actually contributes to a larger, um, a larger effort of people to speak out on behalf of religious freedom. And of course, um, Pennsylvania and Rhode Island are early colon colonies that allowed for religious toleration. Um, but in it, it, uh, efforts such as Anne's really helped turn the tide. So eventually they led to King Charles II passing a, a, to a religious toleration act in 1689. And really, these types of um, positions that people took on behalf of religious toleration really helped lead to the freedom of religion that's guaranteed in the US Constitution. And so now we turn to South Carolina. And this is a, a, a smaller story, but it just again shows the range of, in which these women, these colonial governor's wives, um, they took action on behalf of uh, steps that they really believed in. So this is, um, in 1673, there were these two men that we believe were indentured servants. They were convicted of death. They, they had run away, and under this act, they would be put to death. Now, Lady Yeamans took 
you know, she stirred her fellow gentlewomen to collective political action to step in on behalf of these runaways. And it's, it's, it's a pretty amazing way in which for, for her to use her personal influence. And it, these two men don't appear to have had any personal ties to her. So I, I'm looking further into this case, trying to find out why she took the stand. It does mention in the court records that the runaways had stolen items from different people. Maybe she was one of the victims and didn't want the criminals to be put to death on that, on that account. We don't know. But again, this is a, a pretty amazing um, thing for her to make the effort to do. Now, within the context of the colonial governor's wives stories, I have to engage their Native American counterparts because it's, it's an important part of the American story too. So we know the colonial governor's wives, they could wield this informal power and influence. But amongst many Native American tribes, women had formally acknowledged power. And so uh, Widumu, for example, she came from the Wampanoag Nation. Now, the Wampanoags and many other uh, Indian nations, they, in these, uh, within these groups, women were the primary agricultural workers. And so they controlled the planting fields. They inherited land. The land passed down from mother to daughter, which is pretty, you know, pretty, it turns the, the, um, the, the European colonial system on its head. Uh, but also women were, could be widely acknowledged leaders, spiritual leaders and political leaders of their tribes, um, as well as diplomats. And we have always a, one example I want to talk about. Um, she's a, 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 again, just a pretty remarkable woman in her, in her own right, but she was a um, member of the Pocasset tribe, which is part of the larger Wampanoag nation. She, her father was a sachem, and her mother was a sachem, and her sister was a sachem, which means a, a leader of a tribe. And Widumu, during her leadership, she really tried to protect her people's land. And she also made a series of politically advantageous marriages to, to kind of cement the, um, the strength of her tribe. And in fact, one of her marriages was made to a man, a native man, who when King Philip's War broke out in 1675, uh, this was led by a, a, a native man named Metacom, who the English called Philip. And so Widemu had formerly been Philip's brother and sister-in-law because she had been married to his brother, who his late brother. So Widemu decided that the, for the fate of her tribe and her personal reasons that she should align herself with Philip, her husband at the time wanted to align himself with the English, as did many other Native peoples, but she felt that wasn't the right choice to make. So she split from her husband, she um, became Philip's ally, and she actually became a military leader during King Philip's War. And in my book on Penelope, I talk about um, Winamu because I'm not going to go too deep into this event, but there's one occasion where in 1660, before Josiah Winslow is the governor of Plymouth Colony, he's a military leader. And Winamu and her husband at the time, who is Philip's brother, uh, his name is Wam Suda. And he, is the, uh, he has inherited the leadership of the Wampanoag Nation from his father, whom we know as Massasoit. So Widumu and her husband, Wamsuda, have to spend the night at Penelope and Josiah Winslow's home. And so they're I, just trying to imagine what the situation was like. So at the time amongst English people, there were very elaborate rituals of hospitality and these rituals really served to cement your connections with other people. And they were, they were seen as an obligation. And so I know Penelope on a, you know, on a regular basis would have been, in, you, there are accounts that say she was a, a wonderful hostess to um, paraphrase, but did she exert the same type of hospitality to Widumu and her husband Mamsuda as she would to her high ranking 
English colonial visitors. I, I hope she did. Um, but then I think of how, from Penelope's viewpoint, where she is a, a member of the English gentry and she has this really illustrious heritage would, in her high position also in the colonies, in the scheme of things, she probably thought that, you know, she as a European person kind of outranked Wiedemu, that she was of a higher status. When in the scheme of things, Wiedemu was an acknowledged, a publicly acknowledged leader of her tribe. So she really had the higher status. So again, it's just, we need to think about things from different aspects and not just kind of accept these dominant narratives that are passed down. There are so many perspectives we need to incorporate. And to that point, I also want to incorporate the stories of African-American women in my book. African-American women could hold power. Of course, many were slaves, um, but, they, but many were free women and they exerted um, autonomy and independence and power in different acts, different ways in their lives. But one group in particular I want to look at are the wives of the quote, Negro governors. So in New England in the 18th and early 19th century, there was a tradition of a quote, Negro governor election day. And this, um, these ceremonies were based on a, an African tradition that had to do with royalty, but it also incorporated elements of New England election day traditions. And so the uh, free and enslaved black people would elect a governor, someone of, who would lead their community informally. These, and these, were, um, these occasions were uh, accepted by and large by white people in the community. They didn't see it as, an, as threatening it, threatening in any way. The leaders, the Negro governors would actually oversee their communities in that they would um, be role models, they would settle disputes, they would act as intermediaries sometimes between the black communities and the white communities. And often they were highly respected among the white communities as well as the black communities. And I believe this is also the case with their wives. Um, for example, there, you know, there's an account of a Negro Election Day ceremony in Connecticut. And it talks about how once the um, governor was elected and his lady would sit by his side. So she would receive the, you know, be a recipient of the celebratory attitude on the part of the people who had elected her, elected her husband. Um, and so I want to look more into what type of leadership roles they had in their community, the governors, the wives of the, um, the Negro governors. So, and I'm just showing this a uh, gravestone to a Flor Florio Hercules, um, wife of Hercules, who was governor of the Negroes, dating early in this, um, in this period of the, tr the Negro election tradition. The fact that she had a gravestone erected um, to commemorate her life is, is pretty remarkable. And so it definitely speaks to the fact that there's there's more evidence here of the power that these African-American women wielded. So the period that I'm looking at primarily is in the, that I'm finding the most examples of this female power um, and high-ranking women is the first hundred years of settlement of the colonies. So from this, throughout the 17th century and into the early 18th century. And after that, period, um, by the time of the early decades of the 18th century, the original 13 colonies that would form the United States had come under British control. So the governments have stabilized. So we don't find these examples of wives, you know, going to battle on behalf of their husbands. You know, there are several examples where, where in the earlier period where I find the wives, they have to go to, back to England to help their husbands, or they have to intervene with a, you know, other high standing men on behalf of their husbands because of conflict. But you know, the, the governments have stabilized in the colonies by the early 1700s. Also at this time, there are new ideals that are really permeating society. So the enlightenment ideals of, that associate men uh, with rationality and women with sentiment, um, 
they feed into other ideas about there being separate spheres, that men are, their sphere is the public realm, and that women's sphere is the private domestic realm. And that this, there's no differentiation between women of higher class. So after this point, it's really gender that rather than social class that determines the shape of your life. And so that first tender periods is really a formative time. Um, and also after this time, you know, by the mid 18th century, Native American lands have been um, usurped and slavery has expanded. So uh, Native American and African American women's power is curved too. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a, a fascinating period to, to look at those, the first hundred years. Um, in conclusion, I just want to say that I really think that the, um, the colonial governor's wives, these first first ladies, their stories are compelling and they're significant. And they really help us to re-examine the traditional narratives we have about our country's first years, founding years. These women literally changed the course of history and their actions, reverberations can still be felt today in Americans, American women's efforts to combat forces of patriarchy and sexism, uh, American women's efforts to make their personal choices, act on their personal choices that might de defy society's expectations, and also in American women's continued efforts to shape the United States. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Michelle, it was awesome. Um, you mentioned in your concluding, concluding statement there that they're trying to fight patriarchy and sexism, um, and yet at the top of it, you said that you know a lot of these women have been forgotten. Um, how did you research them? And will any of these really emerge from the shadows? Will we, will we get to know more about them? You know, or are they are are they always going to remain on the uh, uh, on the margins? So two very good questions. So um, I hope that after the book comes out, more book. But it's like there's a continuing fascination with the founding fathers. And there's also, um, you know, I think, should I stop, Mark, should I get out of the share screen? Do you want me to, or do you want me to just keep this uh, share screen? Yeah, well, yeah, why don't you, yeah, unshare. And, and by the way, if anybody's got a question, use the chat feature down below. Okay, great. So, um, so I do hope so. And, you know, so it's an ongoing effort. Early American women's history, it's, it's an ongoing effort, right? So, um, and, and one of the challenges to researching this women, and that was a very good question you asked about how do we research these women's lives? It's very challenging because uh, they, you know, they didn't leave a lot of written records themselves. And for a number of reasons, um, in early in the colonial period, women typically in, in the North, uh, they were better educated than in the South that had to do with their Puritan background. But even Northern women, a lot of them could read but couldn't write because writing was looked at upon as a, a male business related skill that girls didn't need to learn. So there are a lot of challenges, for example, uh, Sir William Berkeley's first wife, we don't even know, before Lady Frances, we don't even know who she was. And she was a very high ranking woman, but we don't even know her name. So um, there are lots of challenges, but there are so many other records that can help fill in the blanks. There are, the, there are government records, there are court records, there are um, vital records, town records, wills, inventories, there's, there really is a lot. So you have to be willing to go beyond traditional sources. Um, and for example, my book on Penelope, she left very little in the way of writing. And so I chose to um, try and resurrect her story through um, material culture. What else did she leave behind? The things that she left behind um, using archeology. span And this is a, also a great way not just to learn about women's history, but also people of color who didn't leave behind written records. Native Americans, archaeology is a fabulous way because 
they didn't like leave behind many written records and the records that do exist that tell their stories are often biased. But when you're looking at the material that's left behind, you get a new perspective. And um, so, yeah, so that's, that's my answer to those questions. Okay. Um, you mentioned education. Was there an education constant? Where, where did they get educated from or were they self-educated? So um, in, again, it's, it's different um, in the North and in the South. So in the North, there was, early on, there was a, a, a um, kind of an informal education system that was established that became more formalized as time went on. But even from the early years in Plymouth, Plymouth Colony, there were uh, women who were teaching. So young children would be sent to what were called dame schools because they were taught by women in their homes. And in fact, in the 1630s, there's a reference in a Plymouth resident's will, a man who says he wants his son and daughter to be um, educated at Mrs. Hicks School. So this happened early on. So both children went to the dame school. Then the sons would go on to secondary school and learn more, um, or the Latin school or college if they were gonna be ministers. Um, but women's education stopped, girls' education stopped pretty early, but it would be continued in the home by their mother. So this is another um, great thread is that the mothers were educators. And um, so, in education was it was valued, um, particularly in the north, um, because again the religious viewpoint is that the whole point of education to these people who were very religious was that you had to be able to read the Bible, but also to engage with it and to understand it. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, comparing a couple of of the women you mentioned, um, Hannah Penn. Um, and Weedamu. Um, mm -hmm. Hannah Penn was essentially acknowledged as the governor of Pennsylvania. By the way, uh, somebody asked a question, the, the portrait of Hannah Penn, was, was that, um, was she in England with that when she sat for that portrait? That's or? a very striking portrait, yes. That is um, supposed to have been done from life. Um, yeah, these, it, the, it's so interesting looking at these different portraits too, you know, just the different approaches of the artists the different techniques, the different skill levels. So yes, that would have been done that, because Hannah Penn was only in um, Pennsylvania for two years. So I believe that was done in England. Okay. Um, how, did, how did males respond to her being the governor? Conversely, Wiedemu, which was definitely much, as you pointed out, much more accepting of women as leaders, how was she accepted as a military leader? So she, so the English settlers had a, the colonists had a problem with, obviously with female leadership, female Native American leadership. I'm going to answer that question first. Um, because, and even as, had a problem with Native American women as planters, because in their society, in English society, men were the farmers. And so they, they looked at it in horror that the women were in charge of the planting fields and they thought the Native American men were lazy for not planting, but the Native American men were off hunting. So it was just a, a different set of cultural ideals. So the, the, um, the English colonists didn't really take the time to learn about the female leaders. So they, you know, you hear in different records, they talk about a sachem's wife or a squaw sachem, but they don't use the, the person's name, the woman's name, where they would use the name of the male leader. So they don't really engage with them at, at all. And as a military leader, um, you know, she was looked upon as, as an enemy. Um, and I, you know, she, she, especially since King Philip's War was such a very violent um, and terrible conflict. As far as Hannah Penn, they, again, so status is coming into play and also the way she, I think her personally, and I'm finding out more about her, how she personally handled it. So she definitely wouldn't have walked into a room and, you know, swaggered and said, I'm in charge of what's happening in Pennsylvania. It wasn't like that at all. And in fact, early uh, on her letters, 
back to um, the legislators in Pennsylvania are, she's talking about, I don't know if I'll do a good job because I'm only a woman, but then she gets her, her letters become more overtly um, confident as time goes on and she's clearly giving instructions. So, um, but you know, I, I think because of the, the way she did it, um, the way she um, used her authority, it wasn't, uh, it, and because she's an acting, you know, it wasn't if she, as if she was an elected figure. So the way, so uh, the context there that it was acceptable for the most part. Okay. We have a question here. Great talk. I, I was wondering if you might have mentioned Governor Dunmore's wife in your book. I realize she's a bit later than those you covered in your presentation. I was curious about royal governors' wives and either their influence on their husbands or even reaction to their husbands' respective actions. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so Governor Dunmore's wife, no, I don't know. I don't know who that is. Who is it? What's the, uh, what colony and what, um, I'll, I'll, look, I'll look her up, but there's, there's so many. Um, because a lot of times these were short-term governors and, but they, you know, left a trace and the wives left a trace. So, but I will look into, um, Governor Dunmore's wife for sure. Um, and onto the, the other question, what did, did governor's wives generally voice their opinions, at least publicly or I'm certainly privately about their, their, uh, uh, the the actions that their husband did, or did they tend to stay in the background? I, I think they would um, generally support their husband's actions. You know, that was their, they would perceive that as their role to support. Yeah, I don't think if there were um, co conflicting ideas, you know, if the wife had a different, had a different idea of how a husband should, have, should handle a, a situation, um, she would likely uh, voice it to him, but she would not publicly, you know, decry his actions. That just wouldn't be, she would look at that as inappropriate, just like society would look at that as being inappropriate. I'm looking at people on the, on their screen and I'm seeing them Googling Governor Dunmore right now. <laughs> um, as you're going through the different people, and I know you wrote about Penelope, did you have a favorite as you're as you're researching these people? Did somebody really jump off the page to you and said, "I really, I, I want to know more about her"? Yeah, it's hard. It, it is hard um, because there are there are so many fascinating people in it, and um, I don't I don't think I have a favorite. I like you know I, I like a lot of them, and and again, it's it's also complex because as I said. It's not, I don't want to say these were all remarkable women and they did amazing things and we should remember them for that. That's not why, because you know, they were human. Um, they were flawed. Sometimes they just used their, their position to act in self-interest. So Lady Yamens, for example, um, who worked to have those two comics lives saved, um, the, the evidence I gathered so far on her was that, you know, she was, primarily interested in her personal estate and expanding that. And she was a slave owner. And um, so it's all, it all is very complex, but I think there's a lot of, regardless of whether you like the women or not, or feel an affinity for some of these women, I think there's a lot of value in their stories and in the context of the development of the colonies um, at the time that's relevant today, you know, that we should know about because, you know, for example, it's just as simple as, um, and, and not to, not to simplify, oversimplify things, but, you know, Hannah Penn, one of the takeaways there is that she helped, Pennsylvania was called a, quote, peaceable kingdom, you know, where religious and ethnic, a variety of uh, people of a variety of religious and ethnic backgrounds could live together peacefully. So, um, you know, that is a, a worthy experiment to, um, for her to underwrite. So, uh, yes, so that's the answer to that. Okay. By the way, somebody typed in, uh, Governor Dunmore was the last royal governor of Virginia. So that, Virginia, uh, I had a feeling it was Virginia. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I 
personally and professionally want to thank you for all you've done behind the scenes. And I was glad for you and for everybody here that, that you got to uh, emerge from what you've been doing behind unbeknownst to everyone that it was all you doing all this this stuff if you go to our website and look at the at the timeline of women's suffrage michelle's the one who did that if you go to um pilgrim hall museum in in plymouth uh, that I, I think they're open at least for partial visitation now you'll see uh an exhibit there called Pathfounders. it's the women of plymouth michelle's the one who did that um Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you for being, um, uh, thanks for being my wingman on all these, on, on, on these uh, uh, series of talks that we've done on women's suffrage um, because Michelle gets a whole lot of credit that she, you probably didn't know all the stuff that she was doing. So I'm personally and professionally really appreciative of all, all you've done. Well, thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions or you know stories they wanna share, they can feel free to reach out to me. Um, I have a website, onecolonialwomansworld.com, and uh, my email address is there. It's mmcoughlin at onecolonialwomansworld.com. So I'd be happy to, you know, if any people have other stories they want me to know about, I'd love to hear them. So thank you, everyone, for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks thank for joining you. us. And just a reminder, like, like I said, our next lecture is at noon next Wednesday, not at 7 p.m. So please make a note of that. Michelle, thank you very much. Right, Everybody, thank you, thank you for joining us. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.